We're going to talk a little bit more about kingdom. <clears throat> As I talk with people and visit with people, they think they know what kingdom is. And I think a lot of times they're a lot like those uh, disciples with Jesus. You know, when Jesus was walking around, he was teaching them what kingdom was. He was talking to them about kingdom. He was explaining kingdom. But every time he did, what their version was, was you're coming into Israel. You're going to set up a civil government. You're going to get rid of all these crazy politicians. You're going to straighten this place out. So every time he would say kingdom, they did not quite understand what kingdom he was referring to. They were thinking in terms of a physical kingdom, okay, <clears throat> a physical place. And I want to give you start with by giving you an example of how that's worked with me, and then I'll explain to you how God wants us to look at it. Because if you don't know what it is, where it is, why it's there, then you miss it a lot of times because you have the wrong definition. So let me tell you a story. This is a story about me. Uh, about 38 years ago, the Holy Spirit gave me this dream and this vision. And in this vision, he showed me this campground. Okay. Now, I had only been spirit-filled for a short time, maybe a year, something like that. And I had kept hearing <clears throat> about uh, light, the light of God, the glory of God. And so I would study it and think on it and everything like that. And God gave me this vision and dream, both. And he showed me this beautiful campground. Of course, it's in the mountains, you know, hello, it's me. <laughs> it's in the mountains, it has the river, you know, it has the creeks, it has the ponds, it has everything you can imagine, and it's all just beautiful. And what it is, is I kept seeing all these wounded Christians coming into this place. And as they were coming in, they would come in and they would get healed, they would get delivered, they would get set free, they would get all the things they needed so they could go back out. And I would see things in this, in this dream, he showed me how it wasn't just to teach them spiritual things, it was to teach them physical things, like how to take care of their bodies, how to do the things they needed to do. It was also soul things, about things like how do you make a marriage better and how do you really parent. You know, one of my degrees is child development, and it makes me crazy when I see some of the parenting going on in this world. <clears throat> and Lord has since made me not correct every parent on the planet. <laughs> I found out that wasn't always wise. <clears throat> but he did have me pray for them, that they would get smarter in how to pray, how to be a parent. But anyway, this camp was just absolutely, unbelievably gorgeous. And I could feel the light. And he said, this is Camp Shekinah. Well, it, that just meant nothing to me. I didn't know what a Shekinah was. And I even saw it written out. So I knew what the word was. But I couldn't really find it anywhere. Okay, I didn't, didn't find any place. Nobody talks about Shekinah. Okay. But I knew it had to do with light. And I knew that <clears throat> this, this campground literally radiated. It had light coming out of it all the time. So, of course, me being me, I knew immediately God wanted me to do this campground. And he needed it to be done today. <laughs> <clears throat> I'm speaking to a few people in here. It needed to be done today. Because obviously, why would God give it to me if it wasn't for today? I mean, you know, what's the way? Let's not wait on things. Let's get things done. <clears throat> So I emphatically drew everything out. I have blueprints, I have scope, you name it. I've got it all, okay. And Gary's just being his patient rock self, you know. That's good, that's good, that's good. <clears throat> so I explained it all to him and he said, uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. I said, we've gotta go find this place. It's out there somewhere. And that's where we're supposed to be, right there in that place. So we're going to have to go hunt for it. Okay. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. You know, Gary's learned. You just give her enough rope, let her kind of fly around for a while. She'll come back in eventually. <clears throat> so in the meantime, God gave Gary a dream. And as you all have heard before, Gary doesn't do a lot of dreaming, or he didn't in the past. I think he's lived with me too long. Now he dreams all the time. 
But in this dream, he knew that the minute he saw that place, it would light up. Like, you know, the God light that comes down on cloudy days. He just knew it would light up. Okay. So now he's a little apprehensive because as we're going out searching, we get to the top of every hill and you can just hear him sucking in the air thinking, oh, this might be it. Okay. I might have to move. You know, you never know. <clears throat> Gary and I hunted for this place all over the United States. And I don't mean that mildly. I mean, we literally hunted for this place. Every time we took a vacation, we were hunting for where it was. Of course, we looked in Oklahoma first. We couldn't find it. We looked in Arkansas. We looked in Missouri. We looked, I mean, I, we've looked from the northeast to the northwest. We've looked, the only place I didn't look was the desert because I was pretty sure that wasn't going to happen. <clears throat> but we looked everywhere. And nowhere could we find this campground. So years went by and years went by. And I thought, well, you know, God's just needing me to lay this on the altar, and when it's time, he'll bring it back to me. And so I literally drug my family to a family camp in North Carolina, one of the greatest experiences we've had, because that's exactly what they did. So we drug them there, and uh, they observed us for a few days, and then they finally had a meeting with Gary and I, and they go, okay, why are you guys here? <coughs> Because everybody else, we can figure out within a day what their problem is. You know, they have marriage problems, parenting problems, ministry problems. Some have, Why are you guys here? And I said, well, we're observing you because we want to do the same thing. Okay. And they're like, oh, okay, that makes sense. Okay, enjoy yourselves. Have fun. Okay. But it was crazy because everywhere we went, again, I kept thinking, I'm getting information so that I'll know how to do this. I'm getting prepared. I've got all my things going. <clears throat> then God began to keep me so busy in certain other areas that what happened is I didn't think Camp Shekinah all the time. What I started doing is paying attention to what he was saying to me. What I started doing is realizing he wanted me to be an outreach to the very things that I was thinking about with the camp. He said, I'm going to send you wounded families. And he did. He said, I'm going to send you people that don't fit into the regular church. And he did. He said, I'm going to make you a hospital so you learn how to navigate what somebody needs and what to say to them and how to help them get what God wants for them. And he did. And then he kept saying, and I'm going to do it over and over again locally, state, national, and international. And so what happened over the years is it began to make sense to me. When I started understanding kingdom and dimensions, that shifted everything. Why did it shift it? Because this is what God was saying. You are thinking only geographically, only in the natural about Camp Shekinah. But Camp Shekinah is in a lot of dimensions. Okay. And in those dimensions, the glory of God will come. And when it does, you're literally taking Camp Shekinah with you wherever you go. Do you see the difference? So instead of me thinking about, I can't minister until I have a geographical place, to minister in, I began to think, you know, I am Camp Shekinah. This, this is me. This is what he's called me to do. He's called me to bring light and revelation and healing and all these things to people. So I realized that he was trying to teach me how to carry his glory to the kingdom places he wanted to redeem. And I could do that if I had the fullness of what I thought Camp Shekinah was with me. So it literally has been like that for years. I feel like I'm taking it with me wherever I go. Each of you that I've talked to and that I've ministered to and that I've helped, you had no idea we were in Camp Shekinah the whole time. <clears throat> but that's where we were. Sanctuary, safe place, a place you could get your heart fixed, a place you could get your wounds fixed, 
a place where what the enemy had brought against you, you could learn how to fight against it. That's what I gave to you. And so today I want you to understand Jesus means for all of us to live in that glory realm. He means for all of us to understand that there is literally a transfiguration that should be happening to you every day. Because the more I understood what God wanted from me, the more Shekinah began to come through me. The more I was able to radiate and people would be drawn to me. Uh, Gary used to say, stop making eye contact. <laughs> and, I'd, and I'd say, what are you talking about? He goes, babe, we're in Walmart. Just keep your head down. Just don't make eye contact. I've only got 30 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> you understand? Okay. Because the minute they would look in my eyes, I could know what was going on. And they would be drawn. I've had people like confess like a priest in the middle of nowhere. Like, blah, 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 blah. and Gary's going, Why? Do you know this person? I go, No. This is God. No. Because there is something when you get into the glory. When you get into the glory, it starts radiating out of you, whether you're aware of it or not. Everybody's spirit is. And they can sense it, and they can know it, and they can feel it. And so you, you begin to understand what it is. So transfiguration literally just means to change into another form, to transform or transfigure. In the Greek word, it's the word metamorpho. And what is so interesting about that word <coughs> is that it's used four times in our New Testament. So I want to read you some of these places to show you what Jesus is trying to talk to us about, about kingdom, dimensions of glory, and to understand what that is. So we're going to start in uh, Matthew 17. Now the sad thing is, and I want to make this clear, the sad thing is, is that when these men decided to create chapters and verses in the scripture, they made the stops at places they thought made sense. But they really don't do that. You know, truly, it's all run together. Okay? So it's like a continual story all run together. So if they had not started chapter 17 here, it would have made more sense if they'd have gone up to verse 28 and understood some of the things that were going in verse 16. Because what had been happening is Jesus, has, he's at Caesarea Philippi. This is where he's at. And he's sitting here talking to the disciples. <clears throat> and what he's saying to them, he's telling them about his death and his resurrection. Okay, He's saying, this is the death that I'm going to have. This is the resurrection that I'm going to have. And you know, I don't think they got it. All right. I don't think they go, oh, you're going to die. <laughs> You know, because in their mind, if he dies, they don't get to have a civil change in the government. So they're not computing this. And I'm saying that because this is what we often do. Um, when we hear somebody give us a report we don't want, my husband's very good at this. When I say something he doesn't like or he doesn't want to hear, he doesn't hear it. And he says, oh, I heard you. And I says, well, do you, he goes, I just don't believe you. Are you hearing? I'm being honest. And he tells me that all the time. He says, I heard you. I heard, and he didn't quote back to me. But it's not making sense to him. It's not coming into him and going, does this make sense to the point you change? Did he change? No, because he didn't believe it. I found that out. If I'm wanting Gary to move, I think have to let Holy Spirit move him first. Because when he believes it, then he'll hear me. Do you understand? I, I know all you husband and wives have never had that problem. <coughs> but, so Jesus is sitting here at Caesarea Philippi. And he's uh, talking about his death. And he's telling them what's going to happen. And the interesting thing is, is he's talking. And he says in verse 28 of verse 16, But I promise you, 
There are some standing here now who don't, who won't experience death until they have witnessed the coming of the Son of Man in the presence and the power of the kingdom realm of God. That is so key for what he's about to tell them. Because too many people you and I know, and most of us started there, we thought the kingdom didn't come until Jesus came back. If you think the kingdom's not coming till he comes back to set it up, you miss this part right here. This part, he said, some of you here will not die before you see me come into the kingdom with all its power, all its presence, all its glory. Okay, now notice what happens next. <clears throat> so six days later, Jesus took Peter and the two brothers Jacob and John, and most of you, if you have other translations, will say James and John, but the real name for him is Jacob. And they hiked up a high mountain to be alone. Then Jesus' appearance was dramatically altered. A radiant light, as bright as the sun, poured from his face, and his clothing became luminescent, dazzling with lightning. He was transfigured before their very eyes. And then suddenly, Moses and Elijah appeared, and they spoke with Jesus. <laughs> now Peter blurted out, Lord, it's so wonderful that we are here all together. If you want, I'll construct three shrines, or the word actually there is the word tabernacles, or tent, which is interesting because it means that's a place to abode or be with. I'll construct three shrines, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. But while Peter was still speaking, a radiant cloud composed of light spread over them, enveloping them all. And God's voice suddenly spoke from the cloud. Now, this cloud, would, have, when it says envelops, it means it would have so encompassed you, you couldn't see past what's in the cloud. So you couldn't see the rest of the mountain. You, you couldn't see anything unless you could see with spiritual eyes. <clears throat> and God's voice suddenly spoke from the cloud, saying... This is my dearly loved son, the constant focus of my delight. Listen to him. Well, the three disciples were dazed and terrified by this phenomenon, and they fell face down to the ground. But Jesus walked over and touched them, saying, Get up and stop being afraid. When they finally opened their eyes and looked around, they saw no one else there but Jesus. And as they hiked down the mountain together, Jesus ordered them, don't tell anyone of the divine appearance you just witnessed. Wait until the Son of Man is raised from the dead. Now, again, they're not getting the whole dead thing. They're not getting that. But they're still so overwhelmed because they just witnessed something that's amazing. So let me give you a little bit <clears throat> of thought. The mountain that, you know, a lot of people when you go to Israel... They'll show you all these sites of where Jesus did this, what happened to Jesus here, da 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 What most people don't know is that most of those sites were identified by Constantine's mother. Okay. Constantine was the emperor who decided that he knew better than the Jews and that he went in, if you, if you read your book, Messianic Church Arising, you know all the history. He went in <clears throat> and basically commanded that anything Jewish was now removed from them. And he decided that they were no longer allowed to worship in their homes and have little churches like that had been set up by the first disciples. It's about 300 years later. He decided that now you had to come to a church, okay, but he didn't like the disorganization of the Jewish influence. So he set up, now you have to have pews, and you have to have a big platform that someone can stand up on the platform. And now it's going to separate the people from the lay people from the priest. All this stuff was Constantine. He never really knew Jesus. Let's make this abundantly clear. He knew of Jesus, just like his mother didn't really know Jesus. And she obviously didn't know the scripture. So when she went to the Holy Land, <clears throat> she went there with the intention of making it a place where people could come as tourists and visit these holy sites. So this woman 
would walk up to a place and she'd start having a feeling. And she'd go, oh, this is where Jesus fed the 7,000, right here. Or she would go, oh, this is where he ascended. Oh, this is where he was born. Do you hear what I'm saying? And so she would go to all these places with the important thing being wherever she got the feeling, that's where they built the church. The church that was the beginning of the Greek Orthodox, which eventually became the Roman Catholic Church. So today, if you visit these places, there's always a nice big church on the place so that it can honor what she decided was where it all happened. <clears throat> well, Jesus probably, this high mountain, they specifically said high mountains. There's a lot of mountains in Israel, but most of them aren't that high. Mount Hermon is 9,800 feet, which is probably the highest one there. So if it took them a while to hike up this mountain, this would have been where Jesus was at because they made it very clear. They had to hike up this mountain, they went to this highest place. She didn't like that because people couldn't get up there very easy. Tourism wasn't good. So she chose another mountain <laughs> to say, this is where Jesus did this. And that happened all throughout everything. Okay, So that's why you have to know your scripture and know what the word says about where things happen. The ascension of Jesus, if you go and see where he supposedly ascended, there's three different places in Jerusalem. They'll tell you, oh, this is where he ascended, this is where he ascended. And hers is in the spack dab middle of the city, which it made it very clear he died outside and was buried in the cave. So these are things that you need to kind of know about <clears throat> the feelings that came with some of these sites and where they were. So um, the interesting thing about this mountain, this mountain Hermon, is that it is where Jesus had this amazing moment and it was very uh, important for us to see. So technically, at the top of this mountain, there was a portal, okay? I wanna show you the two other places that it talks about Jesus in this transfiguration. Go to Mark chapter nine. I'm gonna read you the same story. Now remember <clears throat> that when you're reading these different gospels, they're not to refute each other, they're to give you the understanding that these are examples of you're looking at a mountain and Matthew's version's this side, Mark's is this side, John's is this side, Luke's is this side. So they're not saying this was everything. They're saying this is what I saw or this is what was reported to me. Uh, Matthew, Mark, and John actually witnessed all those things. Luke came a little while later and he was a physician and he went around and interviewed all these disciples and that's how he came up with his telling. He tried to put all the pieces in together. So you see the difference. So look at Mark 9. <clears throat> Jesus said to them, I tell you the truth, there are some standing here now who won't experience death until they see God's kingdom realm manifest with power. The reason I'm talking to you today is because I've got you I have to get you to see that the kingdom realm has power. And it is a dimension that he wants you in all the time. Not just when you get to the high mount, you know, mountain. After six days, Jesus took Peter and, two, and the two brothers, Jacob and John. They hiked up a high mountain to be alone. And Jesus' appearance was dramatically altered. For he was transfigured before their very eyes. His clothing sparkled and became glistening white, whiter than any bleach in the world could make it. And then suddenly, right in front of them, Moses and Elijah appeared, and they spoke with Jesus. And Peter blurted out, Beautiful teacher, this is so amazing to see the three of you together. Why don't we stay here <clears throat> and set up three altars, one for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah? For all of the disciples were in total fear, and Peter didn't have a clue what to say. Just then, a radiant light began to spread over them, enveloping them all, and God's voice suddenly spoke from the cloud, saying, This is my <coughs> most dearly loved son. Always listen to him. And suddenly, when they looked around, the disciples saw only Jesus, for Moses and Elijah had faded away. As they hiked down the mountain, 
together, Jesus ordered them, don't tell anyone of what you just witnessed. Wait until the Son of Man is raised from the dead. So they kept it to themselves and puzzled over what Jesus meant about raising from the dead. <clears throat> In this, I want you to see that um, they said, we want to stay here. Okay, This is another problem that you'll often have when you get to the glory or the presence of God. <clears throat> we have so many people and so many denominations and so many movements of God that step into his presence. They step into his glory. And when they do, in their sane mind, they're thinking, why would you want to leave here? Okay. We just need to sit here and soak. Are you listening to me? There's whole movements, Christian movements, that get people to understand. All you need to do is come into his presence. Every problem you have will be solved. Everything will happen if you just come in and soak. Okay, soaking music. How many of you know about soaking music? <clears throat> it's very calming. It's very, uh, it's just wonderful. Okay, I'm, but the thing about going up to the high mountain is that eventually you're going to have to come down to bring it to the world. The problem, if you want to do just like Peter said, let's just stay here. Let's stay right here. Let's not leave. Okay. Well, that's not how that works. Most of us can't stay there. Most of us are commanded by Jesus to take what we get there and to bring it to the rest of the world. <coughs> Do you see the difference? That's what he's trying to say. <clears throat> so he said something very interesting in both these things. Listen to my son. It's interesting that he said it like that because they had listened to Moses and the law. They had listened to the prophets to some degree. And now he was saying, I need you to listen to my son. I need you to listen to him because he's bringing you the full, the pure, and the true revelation. He's not taking away Moses. Moses, as he's ministering with Jesus and to Jesus and Elijah, they represent the law and the prophets. That's what they were representing. And Jesus was that third thing, the strand that's saying, I'm the son. I'm pulling this all together now, and I'm going to give you this revelation. <clears throat> so this cloud they're talking about, it's the same cloud that happened. You remember when Moses led them out into the wilderness, the cloud that was with them? Do you remember when Moses went up to Sinai and his face <clears throat> radiated so much that they said, put a veil over your face? Remember what they said? Put a veil over your face because you're scaring us, is basically what they said. Because he was just shining. It was a transfiguration. It was a weird thing, you know, that guy's radiating. We can't handle that. So put a veil over it. <clears throat> it's the same thing that happened when they built the tabernacle, when David did. And they were getting ready to do the sacrifices. And the cloud came down as the Holy Spirit, as the Shekinah glory. Because Shekinah literally means the visible, physical, manifest presence of God. Where you can actually see it. That's what transfiguration is. The seeing of the glory. So the, the cloud came in and filled the, taber the tabernacle there with the altar. Do you remember when Solomon finally built the temple? And they were getting ready to dedicate. This cloud once again came in and did that. So it's very important that we see the importance of what was happening to Jesus and why he was transfiguring there on that mountain. <clears throat> so I want to read the last place it talks about um, the transfiguration, and that's in Luke. <clears throat> so go to Luke. <clears throat> and uh, we're going to start with verse 28. Luke 1. Oh, sorry. That's a good thing to have. <laughs> 9. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Keep me on target here. <clears throat> Luke chapter 9, verse 28. And eight days later, Peter took... Oh, wait a minute. Let me read uh, the one before it. 627. But I promise you this. There are some of you standing here right now who will not die until you have witnessed the presence and the power of the God's kingdom realm. Important for you to remember... Because when Jesus did that, he was bringing that kingdom realm to you and I. He was showing us this is the portal, this is the door. 
<clears throat> Eight days later, Jesus took Peter and Jacob and John and climbed a high mountain to pray. Here we get another big piece. He actually went up there to pray. Okay. And as he prayed, his face began to glow until it was a blinding glory streaming from him. His entire body was illuminated with a radiant glory. That means every cell in his body was now filled with the glory of God. His brightness became so intense that it made his clothing blinding white, like multiple flashes of lightning. And all at once, two men appeared in glorious splendor, Moses and Elijah. They spoke with Jesus about his soon departure from this world and the things he was destined to accomplish in Jerusalem. Now, think about this. Peter and James, I mean, Peter, Jacob, and John had to have heard Moses and Elijah, but how would they know who they were? It's not like there were any pictures of them, okay? It's not like they had ever seen them. How would they know who they were? Well, that's what happens when you are in the glory of God. The knowing comes to you, whether you have physical knowledge of it or not. You just know, oh, this is Moses. This is Elijah. There is a knowing because the revelation of the glory is now filling them. And Peter and his companions had become very drowsy. Hmm. When they're praying. Very drowsy. The flesh. Uh Uh-huh. But they became fully awake when they saw the glory and the splendor of Jesus standing there and the two men with him. As Moses and Elijah were about to return to heaven, Peter impetuously blurted out, you know, a lot of times when things are going on around us and we're not real sure what we do, we just say the stupidest things, don't we? Okay. I'm often going, why did I say that? You know. Because now you don't know how to finish it. You just really blew that, you know, because you were nervous. You weren't real sure what was going on. You didn't know what to say. <clears throat> so Peter impetuously burned out, Master, this is amazing to see the three of you together. Why don't we stay here and set up three shelters? Again, let's stay here. This is a good place. Obviously, there's a portal open here. We don't want to leave now. You see, let's just stay right here. One for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah. And while Peter was speaking, a radiant cloud of glory formed above them and overshadowed them. As the glory cloud enveloped them, they were struck with fear. Then the voice of God thundered from within the cloud. This is my son, my beloved son. Listen carefully to all that he has to say. And when the thunderous voice faded away and the cloud disappeared, Jesus was standing there alone. Peter and Jacob and John were speechless and awestruck, but they didn't say a word to anyone about what they had seen. So I want you to understand, this wasn't in the scripture so that you can know that Jesus had access to this portal or this dimension of glory. It was to show you a glimpse of what the kingdom power is supposed to be in you. Okay, What we're going to find over and over again is that there's a reason that God was showing us that peace. The one is to show us how the kingdom power was going to be given to us. The first one is right here in this transfiguration. We got to see Jesus in his kingdom. We got to see Jesus in his glory. Because up until that moment, they had seen miracles, but they had not seen the glory with the miracles. They had begun to seek pieces of the kingdom, but they had not seen kingdom with the glory. He was putting them together there in that one place. And then the second place we began to see that is when he was ascended, when he was resurrected, and he was establishing this new era, this new kingdom. And the third place that we see the transference or the bringing to us the kingdom was when Holy Spirit comes to us at Pentecost. So the bottom line is this. Jesus said, we're the ones who are going to advance the kingdom. You can't advance something that you don't know what you're advancing. 
And you can't advance something without being in that dimension where you carry the power and the glory. Now, the interesting thing is, I don't know if you all have noticed this pattern, but every time you climb up a mountain of God, every time you get a piece, every time you get some information or you have a real spiritual high up on that mountain, let me tell you who's waiting for you at the bottom of the hill. You know what I'm talking about? At the bottom of the hill, Satan's waiting. And why is he waiting? He's waiting to see if he can steal, kill, or destroy what you just got. All right. And I often used to get so mad at God. I know y'all don't understand this, but I would get. I so I just learned this. I have this down. Why are you letting him test me? Why are you letting him do this to me? I would be mad at Mark. Shouldn't I be protected in this la la place? I mean, I have the blood of Jesus. I have the armor of God. I have all these tools. Why on earth are you letting Satan push against me? Why are you letting him make me feel this way? Why are you letting him try and steal, kill, or destroy what I just got? It took me a few years before I realized God allowed this because the only way your faith moves from faith to belief is in testing. Are you listening? Mm -hmm. You can say, oh, I believe. But if you have never been tested in it, ha, 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 ha. Because when the pressure comes on, you don't know if you really believe it or not. You haven't been tried. You haven't been tested. You haven't stood up and said, absolutely not. You cannot do this. So it's really hard if we have these mountaintop experiences and we just think we're gonna to skip to the next mountain. Okay, some of you may be flying, I don't know yet, but most of us have to go into the valley and come back up the next mountain, right? Because it's the testing, it's the trials. Once you've learned something, you need to realize he's going to allow Satan to test you to see if you've really got it. If you really have it, you will use the tools that you have. You will use the authority that you have. And you will be able to make that knowledge now a belief. Something that's strong inside of you. So that it can be tested. It doesn't matter how many times. I already did this. It's not going to happen. But he's going to test you in the areas where you have not established him. Okay, He's going to do that. <clears throat> and the hard thing is, is that we often... Um, when we get tested, we become whiny people. Okay, maybe it's just me. <laughs> we become these whiny people. Oh, this is too hard. I don't want to do this. Can I go back up to the mountaintop? I just want to sit in your presence. I want to stay right there. I don't want to play with the devil. I don't want to have to deal with him. This is too hard. Where's, I want to be the warrior on top of the mountain. I don't want to be the warrior down here in the muck. I know it's just me, I'm sure. None of you have ever done that. But God would say, there is nothing I'm going to give you that the enemy cannot be overcome. Because I've already come everything, overcome everything that he's going to bring against you. There's nothing, no sickness, no failure, no provision, no relationship, no disease, nothing. Are you getting this yet? Nothing that is coming against you that I have not already overcome. And all you have to do is reach in and get my verdict, get my victory and pull it down into you. And when you do, you too get to be the overcomer. You too get to be the bride that says, I am the bride and I'm overcoming this. Because he can't send you into deeper, harder missions until you can successfully complete the test he gives you at each time. 
And that's a problem. Because what happens with too many people is <clears throat> they get to the, oh my gosh, did you see the power of Satan in that? Did you see how fast that person got sick? Did you see how fast they lost everything? Did you see how fast the enemy has overtaken the nation? And they focus on the enemy's power. And they hear how strong the enemy is. And they don't build themselves up to remind themselves how strong their God is. And it's hard. It's hard. Because the enemy has a lot of voices, he's loud, and he definitely is pushing against you in every situation. Um, when Peter was saying, let's just stay here. You know, let's just stay right here in this, on top of this mountain. We'll build shelters. We'll just live here with Moses and Elijah. But that wasn't the mission. The mission was Jesus had to come off the mountain and die. The pattern is you have to come off the mountain and lay your life on the altar. You have to say, if there's anything in me that needs to be gone, then you need to come and you need to make it shifted and changed. Okay? So what God wants you to do is realize he needs all of us speaking to all of us. All right? Uh, I see some of my flaws. Gary's much more gifted. He sees almost all of my flaws. Okay. So if we just went with what flaws I see, the chances are you would not see this compassionate woman standing before you. But when Gary, who I know loves me more than anything, says these things to me, it changes me. And I go, well, what if he's right? What? What? You know, I may not have, you know, are you sure? You get it. The Holy Spirit will say, do you trust the Jesus in him? For years I said, no, no, can't see the Jesus in me. And then Holy Spirit removed the veil from my eyes, and I was allowed to see the Jesus in him. Why am I saying this? Because there's many sitting in here that... We are now a body of Christ. We are now here to help you through your tests and your trials. Okay? You're not in it alone. You're here to use the victories we've all gained. You're here to not make the same mistakes some of us old people have. So you can either choose to make those mistakes, do it your own way, or you can choose to learn from us and say, you know, it didn't go so well for her. I think I'll go that other way. I think I'll do something different. And what ends up happening is you begin then to overcome the enemy. Now let me show you, I want to give you an example <clears throat> of where, uh, you know, Jesus, right after this, the disciples had a test. And they had some a man that came and his son was all demon-possessed. You can read about it in, in all the different places. I'm going to read about it here in Luke 9. The next day, did you get that part? The next day, they came off the mountain. What's going to happen when you come off the mountain? <laughs> yes. When they came down from this mountain, a massive crowd was waiting there to meet them. And a man in the crowd shouted desperately, Please, teacher, I beg of you, do something about my boy. He's my only child. He's possessed by an evil spirit that makes him scream out in torment and hardly ever leaves him alone. It throws him into convulsions. He foams at the mouth. And when it finally does leave him, he's left with horrible bruises. I begged your disciples to drive it out of him. But they didn't have enough power to do it. Are you listening? And Jesus responded, this is kind of harsh, you know. And he's saying this to you and I today. So Jesus is saying this, not me. <laughs> you are an unbelieving people with no faith. Whew. Your lives are twisted with lies. 
that have turned you away from doing what is right. How much longer should I remain here offering you hope? Then he said to the man, bring your son to me. And as the boy approached, the demon slammed him to the ground, throwing him into violent convulsions. Jesus sternly commanded the demon to come out of the boy, and immediately it left. Jesus then healed the boy of his injuries. Key word here, you cast the demon out, but then you need to heal them of their injuries. He healed him of his injuries and returned to his his father, saying, Here is your son. Everyone was awestruck. They were stunned, seeing the power and the majesty of God flow through Jesus. While everyone marveled, trying to process what they had just witnessed, Jesus turned to his disciples and said, This is very important, so listen carefully and remember my words. The Son of Man is about to be betrayed and given over to the authorities of men. But the disciples were unable to perceive what he was saying, for it was a veiled mystery to them, and they were too embarrassed to ask him to explain it. In one of the other (coughs) versions, it says, Jesus, why couldn't we cast it out? And he says to them, because of your unbelief. Okay. Anyone... (coughs) who thinks they know about the demonic world and thinks they have higher revelation of how to take on the demonic world, I can guarantee you that that demonic world is looking at what you believe. If you still have things in you that are agreeing with the enemy, they don't really care what you think. They don't care how many scriptures you have. They don't care how many rituals you go through to get rid of them. Because what they know is you are linking up with the devil and you are allowing him to come into you and you don't even know it. And what often happens is you are just having one demon that has more authority over another demon cast it out. You need to hear me on this. Because a lot of people that think they are doing this are literally just using the demonic thing inside of them to say the demon inside me is bigger than the demon inside you so I can pray that you get healed and you will get healed because my demon commanded yours to go now isn't that kind of scary sad yeah. now that happens Okay, happens a lot but this is what Holy Spirit is trying to say to you when you come into the demon's and you are filled with Jesus, it shifts everything. Because they recognize the Jesus in you. And they recognize whether or not you believe what you're saying. Many people come to cast things out, but the demons are laughing. And why are they laughing? They're laughing because that person knows the head knowledge, but they don't believe it. And so when they start to cast something out, they're doing it just from head knowledge and no demon on this planet cares what head knowledge you have. He only cares whether or not you believe. Because when you believe, it shifts who you are. And now the full power and the full presence of the kingdom is backing up every word you say. He, Jesus just came down from this glory. And what he says to them is this one only comes out by prayer and fasting. So he was so full of the glory, he literally just said, go. Think of that. I pray for the day that you and I are so filled with his glory that deliverance takes a whole 10 seconds. Go. Healing might take 20. Go. (laughs) Go. You see what I'm saying? That's where we've got to get to. But we can't get there when you keep agreeing with this junk of the enemy. When you keep being mesmerized by how powerful Satan is. And when you keep believing the lies of the enemy to where you say, I don't need deliverance. I have one person I was on the phone with this week. 
They're running into all kinds of problems. Surprise, surprise, surprise. <coughs> they believe that when they got born again, all the demons had to go. And so they have no demons. So the problems they have are not from them. It's from everybody else. Everybody else just triggers them. Do you realize how sad the victory is for that person? Why? Because they cannot get to the victories of God because the things in them are literally moving them where they want them to move. So if you were under the false impression <coughs> that just because you're born again, just because you're spirit-filled, and just because someone prayed a three-minute prayer over you that says, we're getting rid of all the junk in you, and there's nothing left, you may want to rethink. Because let me give you the story. This is the first story I ever heard about <coughs> demon possession. Because remember, I was this really good little Baptist girl. Okay. We did not believe in demons, therefore they did not affect us. <coughs> Everybody knows how well that went, right? <coughs> but they didn't. You know, that was just the fallen world. It wasn't demons. It was the fallen world that we lived in. <coughs> the very first story I heard when I got spirit-filled is this one I'm about to share with you. Her name was Theresa. And she was literally in protective custody in a prison in the Philippines. She was in a padded cell. She was in solitary confinement constantly. Because what would happen <clears throat> is the demons would attack her and they would bite all over her. Now, no one actually ever saw the demons. But what would become visible and very obvious to the eyes were these bite marks all over her body, okay? So some would say she's doing it herself. But what would happen is she'd have bite marks all over the back of her neck and her back where she could have not bitten herself. So they brought in all the great psychiatrists to try and figure this out. <laughs> they couldn't figure it out. And there was nothing they could do to help her. They tried all the different things they knew. The reason it's so interesting is this story was actually written up in Life magazine. <clears throat> but they left out the deliverance part. What happened was finally they were so concerned because this woman's in solitary confinement. Nobody can even get in. Okay. And so they called in two American missionaries. One was Lester Summerall <clears throat> and one was Bob McAllister. And so these men had done what Jesus said for them to do. They had fasted, and they had prayed, and they realized that what they were dealing with were demons. Surprise, surprise. So they went into the cell with her. And the minute they were in, the demon flipped out, the demons did. And they, she started having a fit, fighting them off, and they started seeing all these bite marks start coming all over her. And they just said enough. And they took authority and they used the blood of Jesus in the name of Jesus and they cast every demon out of her. And she fell into a heap. When they began to visit with her, they found out <clears throat> that these demons were sexually abusing her and had been for a long, long time. And any time a man would get close to her, they would be jealous and furious, and so they would viciously attack her. Are you listening? And so the men told her, what's going to happen is they'll go away for a season, but they're going to try and come back. And when they do, these are your tools. So as a born-again person, as a spirit-filled person, you have the legal right to use these tools, to bring these tools and say, no, you may not come back. And it didn't take very long, a few days, and they did try and come back. And she stood and said, no. And she was completely healed from that day forward. <clears throat> that was the very first 
deliverance story I ever heard about. So everything under that was like, oh, this is no big deal. I can do this. I can get rid of this one. They're not biting them, okay? You hear what I'm saying? I think Jesus did that to me, so the, the goal was so high, anything under that I could take care of. Do you see the difference? I don't think you can be afraid of the enemy. You cannot be afraid of what he's doing to you. You cannot be afraid, but you also have to be very, very aware. So let's take it back to where we were <coughs> with Camp Shekinah. Camp Shekinah, I still believe, someday may get to actually manifest in the natural. It may get to actually be a physical camp. But in the meantime, I am doing what he needs me to do to be filled up, mature, and pulling on that kingdom power. My greatest heart for you is that each of you will be transfigured. Okay? There are two other scriptures. I'm going to give them to you and you can read them <coughs> and study them more. But these are the last two scriptures about transfiguration. And they're the ones that <coughs> I think help you understand where God wants you to be. One is Romans 12, 2. <clears throat> and I'm just going to read 1 and 2 for you this morning. But I want you to meditate on these because this is what he's telling you. How do you get transformed? How do you get there? Beloved friends, what should be our proper response to God's marvelous mercies? I encourage you to surrender yourselves to God, to be sacred, living sacrifices. And live in holiness, experience all the delights of his heart. For this becomes your genuine expression of worship. Stop imitating the ideals and opinions of the culture around you. But be inwardly transformed by the Holy Spirit through a total reformation of how you think. This will empower you to discern God's will as you live a beautiful life, satisfying and perfect in his eyes. This was the hard, hardest thing for me. It's because I thought I already knew what God wanted. And what I had to realize is the more I learned of God, the more I learned I knew nothing. And so I encourage you today to take everything you think you know about God and how you think about everything and put it on the altar and say to God I give you permission to kill what is not from you kill it I won't talk about it I won't use this technique anymore kill it I give you permission because that's going to be the hardest thing because your mind is where the battlefield is so this is one of the things he's saying to you. You need to study and meditate on that verse. The second one is 2 Corinthians 3.18. <clears throat> we can all draw close to him when, with the veil removed from our faces. Many of you have some glory, but there's a veil on you. There's a veil on you so that others can't see that glory. And you put that veil there because it scares them. It makes them uncomfortable. It makes them not like it. We all, we can all draw close to him with the veil removed from our faces. And with no veil, we all become like mirrors who brightly reflect the glory of the Lord Jesus. We are being transfigured into his very image as we move from one brighter level of glory to another and this glorious transfiguration comes from the Lord who is the spirit I encourage you to meditate on that because that's what he's asking us to do you and I should become so radiant in his glory that people will almost want to say could you just cover yourself up we're not there yet hmm. we're not there yet so the first step is to remove the veil that the enemy and culture has said you must hide behind. Okay? You must stand up. You must take a stand. And you must do what God is asking you to do. You need our help. 
and we need your help. You need to be completely submissive to the things that God's given and the people God's given to you in your life. Not because you're afraid of them wounding you again, but because you need to sense the sincere love and the sincere desire to get you set free. Totally different. I don't need you submitting to me so I can feel like I'm a mucky muck. I need you submitting to the authority that is in me, hear me well, so that I can then bring that victory and authority over you so you can get more set free. My greatest heart's desire is that every one of you far surpass anywhere I've attained in the level of spiritual growth. My greatest desire is that you are so far past me, I couldn't catch up if I tried. That's my goal. So it's not like I have to be over you. A true apostle doesn't stand over anybody. They're underneath pushing everybody to be higher. And that's where we have to be. So let me pray and ask Holy Spirit to remove your veil today. So Father God, we just come. We recognize that there is a portal. There is a dimension. There is a glory place that we need to be in so that we can literally receive your kingdom power and your kingdom presence to operate in this day. We cannot advance your kingdom as you have given us instruction to do. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We cannot bring heaven to earth if we do not have access to that heavenly portal at the top of the mountain. If we do not have access to the prayer level and the fasting level and all of that that we need to do to be able to advance what you need. So, Father, we realize that the enemy, the culture, religious spirit, all these things have put a veil over our eyes, so we see things through that veil. We realize, Father God, that what we thought was truth is oftentimes a perversion of your truth. So we're asking you this morning, we're giving you permission to remove that veil from our eyes, to remove any obstacles or barriers that are blocking us from enjoying and being totally saturated with your glory so that we start radiating out. Father, the kingdom miracles that are supposed to be happening are everyday every breath miracles but we can't take it to the world till we start seeing it in ourselves so today today we lay on the altar everything we thought we knew everything we have revelation of all the revelation we have of you all the things we understand all the ministry keys all the whatever We lay absolutely every bit of that on the altar because we know what will remain is only the truth. But we ask that the fire of God come. We ask that the blood of Jesus come and wash away all those things we thought were truth. Wash away all those insecurities of being afraid of man and being afraid to do it. And Father, I just hear so clearly today, you want to set us free. Some in here think they know how to get set free. But they are deceived. So God is calling to your heart. He's saying today, you lay everything on that altar. Because if you don't, the enemy will continue to be allowed to deceive you. So yes, it's harsh. Yes, it's hard when Jesus calls us these things. But the truth is he does it so that we can be his children, not the children of disobedience. So Father, remove the veil. We lay it on the altar.
And as we worship you today, take us to that kingdom place. Take us to that glory place where we can see Moses and Elijah and Jesus and all of them in that realm and how they want to help us. And we do this in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. <coughs> against the great dragon. The dragon and his angels fought back. All right, so we know which war this is. The very beginning, when he was thrown out of heaven. The next part is key. But the dragon did not have the power to win. And they could not regain their place in heaven. Never has he had the power to win against God. Never has he had the power. We have given him that power because we have believed falsely. We have let fear say, oh my gosh, the enemy is winning. The only place he has the power to win is in those places where the Lord is not reigning. So Lord, reign in me. <laughs> reign in every place. Okay, But this is key. He's never had the power against God. But the dragon did not have the power to win, and they could not regain their place in heaven. So the great dragon was thrown down once and for all. He was the serpent, the ancient snake called the devil, and Satan, who deceives the whole earth. He was cast down into the earth, and his angels along with him. Then I heard a triumphant voice in heaven proclaiming. At that time that he was thrown down, now salvation and power are set in place. Can we say amen? <laughs> then, right then, and the kingdom reign of our God and the ruling authority of his anointed, anointed one are established. Do you hear what we get to stand on? That kingdom is established. For the accuser of our brothers and sisters, who relentlessly accuse them day and night before our God, has now been defeated at that time. Cast out once and for all. They conquered him completely through the blood of the Lamb and the powerful word of his testimony. They triumphed because they did not love and cling to their own life even when faced with death. In my own testimony, testimony, I cannot tell you how many times I have had to die. <coughs> I have had to die. I have had to let that piece of personality that I thought was me, I had to literally kill it and let it die. In, the, in order for life, to truly come in that place to me. But, and I know that you've been there, but I literally had to die. And there have been times that I keep coming to that point and I'm like, Lord, how many times do I have to die? And he says once again, and once again, and once again. 
but it's through that testimony and by the blood of the Lamb and the fact that the enemy has never had the power against God. The more places that we let die in ourselves, the less he gets to win. The less he gets to win. So it is a call. It's a call to die to self. It's a call to allow that kingdom glory to have a, a place to, to flow through because the enemy cannot be it. It's not just a good thought. It is the truth. It is fact that we can stand on. So today what we're going to do is we're going to sing about the word of our testimony and the blood of the Lamb. We're going to practice using our weapons because His glory flows through each one of us. It's just a matter of how much. And it's a matter of how many more places do we have to die. Well, let's find it. And let's do it. But we're going to start by singing about the goodness of God. Because I don't care where you are standing right now, you can look back and you can see the goodness of God. There are places. So let's sing about that. We have all been through hard times. We are all still in hard times right now. But that cannot stop our testimony. Because we have a good God and we can testify of the goodness.
us just where you are. Ask God to forgive you for the times you believed he wasn't good. There are so many times that we didn't understand what was happening. And in those moments, we believed you were not good. And we come and we say we're sorry for those times. Because you are a good, good God. You are a good, good Father. And no matter where we walk, you never lost sight of us. You had to let us walk some places. You had to let us do some things. And that's inevitably when we started asking, why are you not good to me? Why don't you love me? When it was never the case. So forgive us. Forgive our weaknesses. Forgive our sin. Forgive our debt. And repent for each and every time. And we ask, Lord, that you would fill that space with your light and your life and your love. We put to, to death those places to be raised again in life with you. And Father, when we are tempted to say it in the future, when we are tempted to say that you are not good, let us hear that first so that we will never speak it. Because we love you. We love you so much. And we want to live this life for you. And because of you. And in you. Because you gave your blood. The only blood of the only lamb that would take away our sin. Because there is only your blood that defeats all. Power in your blood that flows in our veins. Let us not forget that. We have been raised to life again. Your blood flows in our veins. The victorious power of your blood. The blood that speaks life. Life. We're going to sing there is power in the blood. Now, I, and I don't have the words because he just told me to do this like two minutes ago. So I'm going to sing the verses. I know you know the chorus. <laughs> but listen. Listen and agree. There's power in the blood when we possess it. Or it possesses us.
together. It was not just us. The cloud of witnesses. I heard the cloud of witnesses thundering, thundering in heaven. The power of the blood, because they know, they know better than we know. The power of the blood, and they all sang. And it was just this thunderous sound. And the demons quaked. The demons quaked. Both on this earth, those in Ebus, wherever they are, they just fell to their knees. Yes. Because they know better than we know. Yes. They know better than we know. So let's never forget. There is power. There is power in the blood. And for the first time, we've sung this song how many times? Many of us have come from a place that has sang this so many times. But I want to connect something for you. Third verse. You know, the ones that typically don't sing? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Would you be wider, much wider than snow? Always taking that as he's cleansing me. Right? From sin. But did you hear what Yolanda taught? Amen. Jesus' clothes became wider than snow. Did he have anything to be forgiven for? It was the glory. Are you ready to be wider, much wider than snow? Are you ready to bring the glory of God to this dimension and many others? Let's say yes all together. Yes. Let's say amen and yay God. Amen. I'm not saying it's the end, but I wanted to say that. <laughs> I just hear the Holy Spirit saying that there are many in here that would like some agreement, prayer for what you are going through. So I want to do that. So we have leaders here at uh, Dimension Centers. We have many, many leaders that can pray for you. We have a healing team that can pray for you. So they can if you want to have physical prayer. We'll call it physical prayer. You can ask the healing team members in the back to pray for you. But there are many leaders here today. So what I want you to do is if you need prayer, I want you to raise your hand. It doesn't have to be some, oh, gee, come cast everything out of me. Okay? It's anybody who needs agreement over something they're going through, something the Lord is saying. Raise your hand, and one of these leaders will find you and pray for you. Okay? Be by me. Leaders, look around and see who's there. So this morning, uh, we were having breakfast this morning, Joey mentioned the scripture. He was talking about the sons of Sceva. That's the scripture. The sons of Sceva who have been going out, they've been casting out demons. And they come to this demon, the demon says, we know Jesus, and we know Paul, but who are you? And God showed me something a few years ago that... That question is more not about what the demon believes about them, but what they believe about themselves. The demon is causing within them a doubt. Who are you? And when they begin to doubt who they were as children of God, who have been going out and casting out demons in the name of Jesus, now all of a sudden they have doubt and the demons overtake them. So where are you getting your identity from this morning? Is your identity coming from the enemy? Or is your identity coming from God? And another thing I noticed this morning, as I read on in that scripture, the word began to spread about that occurrence. And though they were overtaken, it wasn't that, oh, these demons are so powerful. The people began to fear the name of the Lord Jesus. Because the demon said, we know who Jesus is. And then they... They beat up the sense of Sceva, but people began to fear the name of Jesus. Because of that, even, even the testimony of demons brought about the destruction of the enemy. Even, even the demons testify to Jesus' movement. Everything we've gained victory over today, everything is deposited in us, Father. We thank you that the veil is removed and our light will shine. And it is 
not something that it stops, but we can get filled up every day and give more and more to you. So we do plead the blood of Jesus. Yes. Amen. Yes. We do say, we do this with the word of our testimony. Yes. That we receive your life and receive your glory. And we thank you for it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Amen